Next up, we have our first panel discussion of the day, the new carbon economy. The moderator is Bill Brandt. He is an AREI Board of Trustee member and the Director of Strategic Integration for ASU Lightworks. Our next panelist, let's see right there, is Ellen Stetchel. She joined the Lightworks team in 2012 as Deputy Director and Managing Director of Lightspeed Solutions. She is also a Professor of Practice in Chemistry and Biochemistry Department. Next, we have Keith Postain. He is the University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Science and Senior Research Scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory in Colorado State University. What are you trying to say? Do you just want to make sure the clicker's up there? Yep. Got it. Yep. And then last, we have Klaus Lochner, um, the Director of Center for Negative Carbon Emissions and Professor at the School of Sustainable Energy and the Built Environment at Arizona State University. Thank you. And thank you. So I just want to give a shout out to Chip and Sally and the rest of the R-Day organizers for a fantastic program. And uh, boy, the speakers this morning got us off to a great start, didn't they? Yes. <laughs> so it was amazing that uh, a couple days ago we had on the platform uh, the CEO of Excel talk about how they are building a massive amount of wind and uh, basically shutting down or retiring earlier their coal-fired fleet. Who would have thought that possible 15 years ago when our day first got started, when solar and wind was a novelty and we were trying to get people's attention? And so when you start thinking about that, you begin to think lots of things are possible, and this is kind of what our day is all about, the possibilities, imagining the future. Today's presentation is a discussion about the new carbon economy. So if you can think about that, this is very futuristic, and we're going to sort of, um, if you'll have it, unlock our imagination, free our minds, and think about what the future could look like. But we are going to stay rooted in I'm going to call it science and technology. We've learned over our day about some new tools that are there. Uh, people have talked about new sensors. We talked about the blockchain. And we talked about uh, how young people are thinking about, and millennials are thinking about, trying to put all these together to think about this as a system. And so when we imagine the future, we can sort of think about what we do to free our minds. And so it's important for us to think, too, about how to break some rules. Breaking rules is a good thing because it allows us to sort of put some things aside that we've always established. And I'm not saying we should break the rules of physics because that's not possible. <laughs> and think more about the future. And so I was at a presentation not too long ago where uh, the, some of the guys from a major bike company were talking about what they did to design a new bike. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to break all of the rules and we're going to design a bike that people might want. And boy, did I want that bike. If it was available, I would have been signing up right away. So with that, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, introduce Ellen Stutchell, who's going to lead us off with the idea of the future of the new carbon economy, how we might break a few rules, how we stay grounded in science, and what we can do. Ellen. Is that what I'm going to do? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Ellen Stetchel, co-director of ASU Lightworks. And in full disclosure, I spent part of my working career at a U.S. automotive company. God forbid. <laughs> um, they're not so bad. They really aren't. <laughs> but before I go further, I do want to thank Bill Brand for putting this panel together, my fellow uh, panelists, and especially Chip and Sally for an amazing week. It really has been. So much has been packed into this week. But it brought a question as I thought about this is, what more is there to talk about? And uh, I love Bill's uh, introduction because this is something, this new carbon economy, uh, and I would, I would disagree with one thing. It's not quite as futuristic. It's actually very close. But that's so true. You know, we go f uh, from, you know, it's impossible, it's futuristic, it's somewhere out there, we can only imagine it, to here it is today. Uh, and that's what I think we're on the tipping point of with this new carbon economy. So that question, what is left to talk about? So what I'm going to try to do is frame this discussion in really three ways. First, I want to connect it to things that have been said, but take on a little bit of a nuanced, different meaning in, the light, of, uh, in light of the new carbon economy. I also want to define the new carbon economy 
as actions that take on uh, the, and, and take advantage of the miraculous and versatile properties of carbon. Rather than looking at CO2 just as a waste product or a pollutant or something bad or something evil, as we sometimes talk about it. And three, I want to pull on the thread of what makes something a solution. Or actually, I prefer to call it options. And we do need lots and lots of options. The more options, the better. Uh, and as Gary Dirks uh, would say, a lot of arrows in the quiver. <laughs> and this really follows from the scale and the complexity of the system that we're trying to intervene with and we're trying to redesign. And we are redesigning, not always. We can't top down and make it happen, but through changing the rules and the interactions and um, the governance structures and new market mechanisms, we are redesigning the system for the better. So first I wanna do is connect to something Chip said early Monday morning. He said something like, uh, if I'm paraphrasing a little, but that we're about 10% about the problem and 90% about the solution. If by problem we mean debating whether climate change is real and climate change is urgent, yes. But if by problem we mean hydrocarbons and ICE must be eliminated, or carbon dioxide is a pollutant and it must be eliminated, that I would submit. We have, re then, we have then recast the problem and we started to both dictate and artificially constrain the option space. In the new carbon economy, we recognize the bulk of the problem quite simply as carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere and in the sur surface oceans because they talk to each other very intimately and the carbon cycle is out of balance. Because, uh, sorry, hence there is excess CO2 in the atmosphere and that excess, as we all know, it continues to increase. But we cannot distinguish a good CO2 molecule from a bad CO2 molecule in the atmosphere, right? We can't, the, one's not good and one's not bad. The, we wouldn't want to eliminate it. It's not like a pollutant. We can't have life if we don't have CO2 in the atmosphere. Problem is we have maybe too much or we're gonna have way too much. So we, what we really want to do, and I think we all know this, is we want to stabilize at some concentration level that we consider healthy. And I'm not going to sit here and debate whether that level's 300, 350, 400, and 450, but what I want to do is translate PPM into mass for you. Maybe some of you know these numbers, but it's not the way we usually talk about it. There's 3.2 trillion metric tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. One trillion, we almost exactly crossed the threshold of one trillion excess CO2 over pre-industrial times. So, and that, and we're also, the rate we're increasing, and we're still increasing, we haven't bent it over quite yet, we thought we were close, 19.5 billion tons per year. Keep going up. So one key aspect of the new carbon economy is that it is inevitable that we will be mining that excess. Like solar, even just a decade ago, mining air for CO2, whether directly, as Klaus will talk about, or through ter terrestrial means, as Keith will talk about, they have been on a journey. Everybody in this space has been on a journey from the impossible to the improbable, and now, or very, very soon, the inevitable. The future is here, just about today. The current economy, as we know it, has huge carbon flows. You all know that. But it's not that we have large flows, it's that it's out of balance and leading to the accumulation. Put another way, we have sink, the sinks, the sources exceed the sinks. So to rebalance, we have to have some combination of reducing the sources and increasing the sinks. It's not one or the other. And we need to do that until we're back in balance and we don't have an excess. It isn't, as I say, it isn't about an either or. So a frame a lot of people can relate to is waste management. Reduce, reuse, downcycle, recycle, and dispose of what's left. Dispose of what we can't turn into value. However, I prefer a frame that doesn't really talk about waste. After all, the biosphere doesn't know from waste. 
The circular economy doesn't know from waste. Waste in our economy today is actually just unutilized resources. We just have to learn how to utilize them. So what we really want to eliminate is CO2. It's not CO2 and not necessarily hydrocarbons, but the mobilizing of fossil carbon, ambient carbon, buried sunshine, and releasing it so it accumulates in the atmosphere and the surface oceans. And then bad things keep happening. We all know that. Let's not forget, though, that on the basis of this old or ancient carbon economy, there has been a lot, a lot of good that has created. And in the process of trying to fix the ills, perhaps we are on the cusp of trying to throw the baby out with the dirty bathwater, as you say. So, ah! Technology. <laughs> So, we talk about fossil as primary energy, but it isn't. What we really need to recognize is it is stored energy, and it can be stored in that form indefinitely at very high energy density and moved at very high power densities. The amazing talk this morning talked about, you know, kilowatts of charging of batteries. When we move energy in the form of hydrocarbons, we're moving it at the rate of multiple megawatts. Multiple megawatts, keep that. It's, it's mind boggling if you really think about it. So no matter how good batteries get, they are part of the solution for sure. They are most likely not going to be what solves the problem of seasonal storage or multiple days of storage. So energy carriers such as hydrocarbons, but also hydrogen and ammonia potentially, can be very, very good options. We also, we talk a lot about scarcity and finite resources. We fail to recognize that we actually have an abundance, an abundance of natural resources, an abundance of sun, an abundance of CO2, and, and Bill, you said this, no bounds on imagination and innovation. What we have is a very inefficient system of using those resources and a destructive system. That we have to do much better at. So I, I do ask you to suspend a little bit of disbelief and remember how many times we have gone from the impossible to the improbable to the inevitable and how many times we failed to predict the outcome, especially when we start down the path, as Ariel said, curiosity, exploration, and discovery. A lot is possible, as long as we don't break the rules of physics, but there's a lot of room in there. So the new economy, it's mostly about unleashing innovation, an innovation ecosystem that seeks to find economic value to create markets from an abundance of CO2, an abundance of sunlight, or other renewable resources. If we can make hydrocarbon sustainably, that meaning from excess CO2 mined from the atmosphere, from brackish or seawater, land that doesn't compete with food production, so, and, and using sunlight as the energy source, like photosynthesis does, but do it much more efficiently, then we can, we can God forbid, even extract it in clean burning ice to yeast um, or in fuel cells, and take advantage of trillions and trillions of dollars of infrastructure and know-how, that would be a new carbon economy product. And one that's very worthwhile that we're talking about, you know, let's make sure we don't use that anymore. There was a standing ovation when we talked about eliminating hydrocarbons and ICEs. It's mind boggling to me, actually. <laughs> that, as I say, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of very good properties there. If we make plastic and make sure that we recycle it, not in the ocean, that could be a new carbon uh, economy product made from CO2. If we do concrete and aggregates from mined CO2 from the atmosphere, that could be a product. And one of my favorites is actually carbon composites, and it came up in the um, efficiency, um, it, replacing steel with carbon composites, lighter, stronger, more energy efficient. Same thing's true if we put it in airplanes, we put it in cars, and a lot of things. We can put a lot of carbon potentially in the uh, built environment if we can learn how to do this efficiently and affordably, of course. But one we don't talk about, um, we talked about nature needs half, right? But 
if we could take, we could make food at 5% sunlight to food efficiency, we would only need less than 0.1% of land to feed 10 billion people, to pro provide enough energy for the same 10 billion people at US end use, as inefficient and wasteful as we are, not advocating that we do that, but and do that from the sun in an average of 10% efficiency, that would only take 1.4% of land. We do have an abundance of resources. What we have is an inefficient and destructive use of those resources. And that is the primary reason we think we have a scarcity. So what I would want to leave you with one thing, one thing, please recognize we do have an abundance of resources, an abundance of innovation and imagination, and we can unleash this new carbon economy. And I'll stop there. Yeah. So thank you, Ellen. So Ellen, I want to ask you a question um, about your interests and in research. Um, you talked about um, you know, hydrogen and ammonia, and um, I'd just like you to talk a little bit about why you're passionate about those things. Well, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thanks for that opportunity and a little bit more time. Um, so what we're trying to do, so I, I mentioned that if we can unleash um, the, the power of the sun to reactivate uh, CO2 and water and make, uh, break, break the bonds, reorganize them. We can reverse combustion. We can make hydrocarbons that are sustainable. Uh, we can take advantage of the infrastructure. We can make renewable hydrogen and we can use them in highly efficient um, uh, fuel cells. They're great energy storage. We can imagine seasonal storage. Uh, we can make the food system just on this one thing. We make renewable ammonia. We can make the food system far more sustainable and a lot of other actions uh, that I hinted at. If we can actually, by un just unleashing all that abundant sun, but using it efficiently, and that's what we work on, is using the sun to break apart CO2 and water and then rearrange the bonds so that we can make pretty much any product we want. Because carbon is only the two most versatile elements on the entire periodic chart, and I think it was, I am a chemist, so that's how I think, the, um, is carbon and hydrogen. There's virtually, virtually nothing we can't do without, uh, without those two uh, elements. Right. So we can um, make a, a, a sustainable built environment, a sustainable food system, a sustainable transportation system, and a su sustainable electrical system. So thinking about it as a system, which is part of the uh, topic for our day, Ellen's like, got these really interesting ideas about how do you exercise the system to sort of create efficiencies, and how do we exercise the system to reduce mobile carbon. So thank you, Ellen. Keith. Should, should I? Whatever you want. To undergrads, they like to have <laughs> something to look at. So I, I have a few slides. As a, as a prop. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about carbon dioxide removal through terrestrial processes, specifically looking at the soil. And, you know, until Ellen was talking about this, I wasn't really thinking of it so much from the standpoint of, of taking carbon dioxide and, and making it into something useful. But of course, nature does this automatically, right? And if you think about soils, um, if soils don't have organic matter, in other words, carbon-based molecules in them, it's not, it's not really soil, right? And I guess you've all uh, seen The Martian, the movie, and you know what Matt Damon had to do to turn the Martian dirt into soil. So that's, you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> so we need organic matter, we need carbon uh, in that soil to make it, it healthy and to, to make it function. So what I want to talk about now is, is looking, though, at, at the whole issue of, of um, you know, the perturbation in the atmosphere. By most estimates, we can't uh, reduce emissions fast enough to stay on a trajectory that we'd like to have for a, uh, uh, a sustainable climate in the future and we need to actively remove some of the CO2 that we've put up there. So I want to really look at, at the terrestrial part, particularly the soil, 
kind of how does it work, uh, how much can we really do with that, and, and, uh, and, and how, how are we going to do it? So the first thing is there are, you know, it's all about land management practice. So we've got uh, something on the order of, of about uh, 5 billion hectares of land on earth that we actively manage as, as grazing land, as croplands. And there's a lot of practices that are just good management practices that we already know how to do now. There's, and, and they're proven, uh, proven practices that can build the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if you look at uh, you know, this kind of simple diagram down here, it kind of, uh, see if I can get the, uh, no, that says danger. Maybe I don't push on that. I don't know. Okay. Or maybe I do. Well, the, the, little, uh, the little cycle down there is basically you're trying to manipulate the ecosystem. You're trying to increase the carbon inputs, which, of course, are photosynthetic fixation of carbon into plants, reduce the, the losses through uh, soil respiration, the, 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 the cycle, and build up that organic matter in the soil, and there's a variety of different ways to do that. And of course, there are innumerable kinds of, of side benefits. We need to do this anyway for managing healthy ecosystems, irrespective of, of the carbon issue. Uh, and then, you know, that's what we can do now, but we also, the, the, the scale of this, we need to really look at, at what I call frontier technologies, things like um, it was, I think, the previous speaker mentioned the Land Institute and, and, uh, and Kernza. So the idea of perennial grains, uh, and that's, you know, Kernza intermediate wheatgrass, and there's a picture there of Wes Jackson in the, in the Land Institute holding the, the root system from one of these plants. And so if we shift more, you know, land to perennial grains, increasing the carbon that's going into the soil, Changing our annual crops, uh, there's groups that are, are working at putting more suberin content into roots, bigger root systems, you know, biochar amendments, there's a whole variety of different things that aren't really quite ready to go now, but with R&D, they, uh, you know, they can come into play. So, so how big might this part of the solution at least be? And, you know, that's... that's that, that all depends, right? But one way to kind of frame this is to look and say, gee, how much organic matter, how much carbon were in the world's soils before we started actively managing, before we deforested, plowed the prairies, turned them into cropland, this sort of thing? And there's an estimate of a, in a, in a uh, PNAS journal last year that Jonathan Sanderman had somewhere on the order of about 130 billion tons of carbon or almost 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So just to give you an idea of the, the magnitude of that, that's, that's roughly about a, a third of the amount of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels that we've added since the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution. So it's a big amount of carbon that's been lost from soils and we know that, that we can replace at least some of that. A uh, paper a couple years ago that I was on with, with some colleagues, we did an estimate, you know, through looking at different kinds of practices. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is you can see on this, you probably can't really see the axis, but the vertical axis is kind of the area uh, in terms of millions of hectares upon which you could potentially use different practices and the, the, the uh, horizontal axis is the amount of carbon dioxide that you could take up and store in soils you know, per hectare. So you kind of notice this inverse relationship. There's certain things that you can do, like restoring peatland soils, where you can take up a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide per unit area, but there's not that much area. So there's a kind of a trade-off along that. But, you know, at least in terms of technical potentials, we came up with an estimate of somewhere on the order of four to eight billion tons per year over several decades of CO2 removal into soils, regenerating soils would be possible at a, a kind of an upper level. And this, this is equivalent to about uh, half of what is estimated we need to have in terms of negative carbon emissions by you know, the end of the century for this, this kind of a glide path for uh, reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, 
So, so, how, so if we're going to do this, what are the kind of tools we can do? And I would say the, the main thing, we have to incentivize the people on the land that are managing the land, you know, in the case of cropland farmers. Um, and, and how do we do that? You know, we can do that through government programs to some degree, uh, maybe not the most efficient, particularly nowadays in the U.S., but certainly there's efforts in, in other places. Uh, there's beginning to be, you know, more and more interest in ecosystem services from, you know, something other than just, you know, uh, bushels of wheat is, can, can, can we market ecosystem services produced from land management, things like carbon markets, for example. And then increasingly, companies that want to be more sustainable. Almost anything you buy that has a, uh, you know, an agricultural base to it, whether it's a food product, whether it's wool, cotton, your clothing, whatever, the biggest fraction of the total life cycle embodied carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions of that product, the carbon footprint of that product, the biggest portion of that occurs within what we'd call the farm gate. So it's how you manage the land. The downstream, how you do your manufacturing transport is actually a fairly small part. So there's a lot of companies now that want to produce products with a low carbon footprint. And their land management uh, is critical to, to do that. Uh, and so there's these different ways we can do it. One of the issues, of course, with, with, with this kind of, uh, th these kinds of incentive systems and markets is really the quantification. How much carbon storage are we actually getting? The problem is it's not like we can measure with a, you know, a thermometer or something like this. The carbon is dispersed across these you know, billions of, of hectares of land area. So it's a, it's a difficult job. Uh, the, again, they're, they're dispersed, temporarily variable. Lots of different processes and, and, and factors control the rates of this carbon uptake. Uh, we can measure things directly, but you need to really, for the most part, go to a university and, and hire guys like me to come out and do it, which isn't going to be, is going to be, uh, they don't pay me that much, but it's still going to be expensive <laughs> if you got to do it on, on every farmer's field. So we need to have robust data-informed model-based systems. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of interest in this. There's a, a kind of a an activity going on now, WRI and, and several universities are, are working to, to look at putting together essentially a global carbon information system for forecasting, quantification, um, and uh, I won't go into the, all the details there, but there's a lot of scientific infrastructure that we can mobilize, but we've really got to put it together again in a system, in a smart way, uh, and to make something that would be equivalent of a, you know, say a, a, a national weather service or a global weather service to, 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 to forecast and quantify uh, carbon in, in our ecosystems. And then finally, just to kind of summarize the points, so soils and natural capital solutions can really play a cru crucial role in this global greenhouse gas mitigation, but you know, don't kid yourself, it's going to require a fundamental change in the way our, our managed land systems look like. But just like the previous speaker this morning was talking about disruption, here's how our road systems are going to look like in the future, right? Like nothing like they look now, like now with, with uh, uh, you know, with solar panels and, and on the roads, on the sides, uh, et cetera. Uh, we've got to think big, we've got to think transformative. The good thing is, it's again, it's not just the, the greenhouse gas mitigation benefits, it's all kinds of, you know, soil health, water quality, air quality, et cetera. Uh, I think we need to think, think of a two-stage strategy. We've got to ramp up the best management practices we know about now, but we also got to have the R&D to really scale up uh, frontier disruptive kinds of land management. Um, uh, technologies and and we need to we need to partner with the people on the land that are making this happen and they've got to be incentivized to, to do that and then finally to really make this happen I think you know science-based measurement monitoring systems are, are really going to be key and this is where the the research community I think comes in all right thanks <laughs> Well, 
So, so Keith, I want to ask you a couple follow-up questions, if that's okay. <laughs> Great. So I, I, I've heard people talk about uh, soil health, and I've heard people talk about the idea of carbon improving water retention, and that all sounds like a great idea. What's holding farmers back? Uh, that, no, that's, that's a great question. Uh, to some degree, you know, if you, if you think of the pioneer farmers that came to eastern Colorado or they came to the Midwest in the tall grass prairie, the organic matter in the soil was a resource. It's not only carbon, it holds nitrogen, it holds phosphorus, it holds all the nutrients that plants need. So they were able to break the prairies uh, and grow prolific crops for you know, two, a couple of decades without adding any nutrients back, without fertilizing. And then of course, unfortunately, the, the productivity, the fertility went down, they moved on. Uh, and, and, and now, of course, that's, you know, we've, we've largely broken that, that cycle. But it is an issue. You know, there's a conundrum of using the organic matter as a resource versus preserving it for, for soil health. And, and part of it is if you think of things like, so how would a farmer do this? In some cases, they, they do do it, um, and they increase their organic matter, and they increase their profitability. Uh, in some cases, they might not know exactly how to do it mm -hmm. because it wasn't how grandpa or dad farmed. Uh, in some cases, it, it actually takes at least an upfront cost. So farmers in the Midwest plant a cover crop. Don't leave the soil bare during the fall and the winter and the spring. Mm -hmm. Have something growing there. Well, you have to purchase the seed. And some, you know, and maybe the, the seed producing, you know, there's only two or three percent of the of the land area getting cover crops. There is not enough seed production. The seed is expensive, you know. So there's lots of of uh, of kind of minutia there. Mm -hmm. They're all, I think, barriers that can be overcome. But a lot of times the, you know, it, it, it's like, a, and you're a chemist. So think <laughs> of an exothermic reaction, right? So you get an energy yield, but first you have to get over a hump. And that hump, you've got to have something to take you up to the, to the higher level. And you know, that's a catalyst in the case of you know, chemistry, but in the case of, of uh, our land management systems, it, it's you know, incentivizing producers to do the right thing. And I think that can, that can happen again through lots of ways. Uh, you know, and, and young people are increasingly interested in, in how do I get products you know, that are low carbon footprint, low, high sustainability. So I think that's a, a, a way forward. So there might be this interesting interaction between creating prosperity for rural America through consumers <laughs> actually making the demand and paying a little bit extra to allow farmers to make the conversion. Because you said it costs a little bit more, but the benefits are there. And of course, the benefits are there in uh, carbon retention in the soils. And that long term, that's a good thing for the planet and for the ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's, no, that's a good summary. And there are, again, a lot of knock on things. We're, we're now going to be doing a project out in Maryland where, of course, they're primarily interested in Chesapeake Bay and reducing the nutrient runoff mm -hmm. from the, uh, you know, fr from, fr from the cropland surrounding the bay. And can we use nutrients, tie up those nutrients in organic matter, you know, uh, utilize less, uh, you not only are going to be sequestering carbon, but you're going to be uh, cleaning up Chesapeake Bay as well. So there's a lot of, of those kind of synergisms in that national natural capital space. Right. So in a way, um, there's lots of ways to get a lot of people engaged in this whole idea of the new carbon economy. There is. Yeah. And with that, I'd like to go to Klaus Lochner uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, new technologies. And I'm, I'm tethered. <laughs> I don't oh, want to right. get up and, quicker. Get and, tear, <laughs> and tear the whole thing apart. So my job today is to talk about air capture. And I think there are two ways to look at this. The first question is, is it necessary? The second question, is it feasible? And if we cons consider that, then lastly, how, we go how can we go about it? And I argue, and I will start here on the necessary part, uh, cleaning up climate change is actually critical. We have reached a point where we can 
can't do without it. And I actually do see, in the long run, a whole number of interesting business opportunities in all of that. And, but let me first put some, some, some scale to all of this so, so you, you get a feel for this. And I would argue, uh, Ellen is right, there's a certain amount of CO2 that's already in the atmosphere and better be there. I like Gary's analogy, Gary Dirks's analogy of saying, the Earth is wrapped into a CO2 blanket which keeps it warm, and that's a good thing, and we need that one blanket, but we have, since the early 1800s, added one blanket after the other on top of it, and at some point or another, we need to stop doing this, and, by the way, then figure out how to take those excess blankets back off, because if we don't, uh, we will be in trouble. If you look at what people consume, uh, I think the most we consume actually is water. We are approaching like a, nearly a ton a day. Uh, so this is an enormously large thing we, we consume. The second largest thing we consume is sand and gravel, sort of known as aggregate. And that adds up to some 30 billion tons a year. And then anything else like steel, we're down to a billion tons, small potatoes compared to those really big things. But there's one thing in between which we are not consuming, which we are spitting out, and that's CO2. And that is actually bigger than sand and aggregate together. What we produce from fossil fuels is 36 billion tons of CO2 a year. So we are actually exceeding anything else. And that's why I think in the, in the very short term, I, don't, I have a very hard time seeing that we simply consume all of that stuff and make good things out of it if you actually make rocks out of it, you more than double the weight of it. So we don't consume uh, 70, 80 billion tons of rock. We don't do that. So and if you now come with, with carbon fiber, we, we're not even coming close. So I think we need to start thinking about this as a management, waste management issue. We are piling carbon up in the atmosphere. Uh, that's, that is a waste stream we need to stop. Yes, it's good to do re reuse, reduce, recycle, but at the end, we don't have any, have we are taken right now the excuse we are saying, we try to reduce, we try to recycle, we did all of that, but now that we couldn't figure it out, we just dump it into the atmosphere. That part has to stop. First and foremost, we have to go and say there is a requirement for disposal, and we have to convince people that that needs to be done. Thank you. Beyond that, we can then say, well, is it really sustainable to create all that garbage? Do we really want to keep indefinitely being in the landfill business? And maybe we should figure out how to make less waste and the waste we have convert into useful products. As a matter of fact, if, if we are in a position where we are disposing of the carbon dioxide because we figured out that's the right thing and the necessary thing to do, we actually create an additional value to make it useful. So I would argue we have to do this at some point and figure it out. So what do we need to balance the books? I think we need three things. We need to have that landfill analogy. We need to have carbon storage. And I know that generally people feel very uncomfortable about carbon capture and storage, but we have these extra blankets around us. We have to pull them off. We have to put them somewhere. We have put out more than a trillion tons of CO2 already, and at the current rate, we will easily exceed what we, what we should do by 100 ppm, even if we slow down as fast as we possibly can. Even the agreement we made in Paris has made it very clear that we need to get to negative emissions, and the, those negative emissions will have to get large. We have to decelerate emissions, but at the same time, we have to get rid of the waste pile we have, and if you have to put 100 parts per million away somewhere, that is equivalent to 1.5 trillion tons of CO2, which have to find a home. This is more, to put it in perspective, than the world emitted between 1900 and 2000. We have an enormous challenge there in front of it. If we want to stop producing all that CO2 and emitting it, then we better close the carbon cycle, and there is, in my view, no better way to do this but to make synthetic fuels. And I would uh, look around and ask, who of you did not come, uh, who lives outside Colorado, by airplane or by some other means like that? We will need transportation fuels to make things work. 
we will have some consumption of fossil of, of liquid fuels. We don't need to have them to be fossil. We can get it from somewhere else. But we can get it from the air. We can use renewable energy and sunshine to convert that CO2, unburn it, so to speak, put the energy we took out when we used it back in and make fresh fuel. We can close this cycle. And by the way, if you run on intermittent solar and wind energy, you really have to do it anyhow, because there's no way that summer and winter will be matched. And while batteries are great to store things overnight, they are horrible to store things between summer and winter. You want to make chemicals you can store for a very long time and then come back to them whenever you need it. But in order to close the cycle, in order to make all of that happen, you actually need to pull CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And you heard Keith say, we are talking maybe of five gigatons a year. We can reasonably do that by, by doing it by biological, agricultural means. I'm arguing if we want to come back 100 ppm and do this in 40, 50 years, we need to have a, a section on the system on pulling back on about the same scale we are currently emitting. Because we are raising the CO2 in the atmosphere by about two and a half, two to two and a half ppm a year. If we want to come down by the same amount, by the, ocean, by the way the ocean will give its part back as it does that, uh, we will have to pull back at about the same rate. This is so large that we better have the ability to pull it directly out of the atmosphere or maybe out of the ocean. I'm arguing the atmosphere is the easier and faster and better way to do. So people, I know people are skeptical about direct air capture, but I would answer to that, I can't prove until we actually did it that we really can do it affordably, but I can be, I can be quite certain that if we fail to do that, we all be very, very miserable. We better invest very heavily into the research which makes these technologies available because if we can't figure it out, we are in trouble. Now, we are working on this at, at ASU, and I give you here sort of a, a bunch of little pictures which show you the trajectory we have been on. Uh, first of all, I have argued all along that the right way of doing it is passive, like a windmill. And what convinced me very early on, if you look at a big windmill standing out there in Kansas, in one afternoon, that passes a cubic kilometer of air. If I give you five cents, per, if I'm mining that kinetic energy at five cents per kilowatt hour, uh, I saw $300 worth of, of kinetic energy sweeping by in that cubic kilometer. If I give you a tipping fee of only $30 a ton of CO2, that same cubic kilometer of air, which just gave you $300, had $300 worth of kinetic energy in it, has $21,000 worth of CO2 in it. If we can do wind energy, we can do air capture, provided we are passive. We let the wind bring it to us, just like it does for the leaves on a tree. So you see here on the left, uh, early on at the last three years, four years now, I have been at, at ASU. We have built these little prototype devices. The, little, the ones on the left are living in the laboratory. There's no real wind, but they dry out. We put them into the container and then make things wet. Our particular material has the feature that when it's dry, it loves CO2, and if it's wet, it gives it back at 3, 4, 5% CO2 in the environment. We then built this little square box you see then covered in, in, in solar protection up on the roof of a building where it ran for six months and worked very well. Then the next unit where the sun is shining through the panels, these are the filters. You can think of this as the leaves of the system is standing out at Mesa at a polytechnic uh, campus of ASU. And it is right now, as we speak, probably, I haven't checked this morning, uh, collecting CO2. The wind blows over the, through these filters, and then these filters collapse back into the box at the bottom, where they get inundated in water, and then it releases the CO2, which we then feed to an algae pond. And what you see at the last picture, the Tiburio design, uh, it's a, uh, uh, our new proprietary version of looking at it. I think we can greatly reduce the cost of making things work, and we are trying to work out how to make this sort of an industrial standard from which one could work forward. So here you see a few more pictures of the current design while it still lived in the shop. And so you can see that we can do this. And lastly, here is another view of it standing out in the real world, collecting real CO2 
uh, from the environment, and it even fed a little bit of CO2 to an algae pond. It turns out the teething problems on a very first of a kind, by the way, to a large extent, in the software of running the thing, opening and closing, between us and the finickiness of algae ponds, the days they worked, we didn't work, and vice versa. So the amount we actually transferred is still quite small, but nevertheless, we have started. This is a real thing. We are on a trajectory to move forward. If you now ask, where do we want to go? We have to go to a device, which I would argue should get relatively rapidly to the $100 mark. You can see David Keith just published a paper where Carbon Engineering said, we have a, and I hate to say it, but it's true, a very brute force process, which we estimate can collect CO2 somewhere between $100 and $250 a ton of CO2. That process requires 900 degrees C in the middle. It's a very complicated process. I applaud their engineering. They did a great job making it come down to that price. But I can tell you, they build a locomotive with wings on it, and it's flying. That's great. Uh, now we come along and trying to build a, a right flyer. <laughs> and we, are, we are a little more risky because nobody has seen how to fly yet. But we will, at the end of the day, uh, be inherently much cheaper because we are not pumping air through systems. We are not tying it up with calcium hydroxide to calcium carbonate and then free it again at 900 degrees C. We just expose our material to water vapor and it releases the CO2 again. So I think we can move forward and in the end, I see us mass producing lots of little units, uh, one ton a day units, figure that they are maybe the size of a trailer truck. And if you have 100 million of them, you can actually pull the CO2 back. If you think 100 million is a very large number, uh, we have a billion cars on the planet, uh, actually more than a billion cars. If they last 10 years and you want to maintain a fleet of 100 million units, you need to build 10 million a year. We are building right now 80 million cars and trucks a year, which again shows you we can get to the scale. And by the way, Shanghai Harbor sends out trailer truck size shipping containers, which each contain more stuff than these individual units would. So we clearly have the industrial capacity and it comes down to the willingness to actually do this. I think in the long term, we have no choice but to introduce, just like we did in sewage, just like we did in air pollution, that we end up, uh, and, and garbage itself, that we end up pulling it, pulling it back and pay for it. Nobody in his right mind today would build a house that doesn't know how to deal with it. sewage and we, we take it for granted that we have to pay for the waste management of our garbage. I couldn't come to you and say, I reduced my garbage this year by 20%, so tolerate what I dump in front of, you, of your driveway, because it's okay, I reduced, right? We have to go past this point and actually pull it away. And if you look at it, companies like Waste Management, which is the name of a real company, actually make good money in this paradigm, but in the end, it will require a consensus and a regulatory framework which says you must do it and you cannot just dump illegally your garbage into the atmosphere. And I'll close on that. And thanks for your attention. So, so Klaus, I, you know, sort of uh, in thinking about this, uh, this, is, this is a really big project, uh, 10 million units a day. Uh, that would be terrific. A year. a year, right? 10 million units a year. Uh, that would be terrific for a manufacturing, whether it's in the US or Europe or China, uh, because it's a new industry. Um, there'll be lots of jobs created. Um, what's holding us back? Well, several things. Uh, one is any new technology is expensive. Uh, I think even, even Keith, with his carbon engineering, they would be hard pressed to scale up, and they are still at $200 a ton, mm. right? But imagine in 1960, we would have said, $2 a kilowatt hour for photovoltaics, forget it. We don't even want to get there. Of course, the first of a kind are expensive. So coming in, people will say it's impossible. The other part is we have to get past the point where we say, well, only the purest answers are right. Right? You, can, you cannot say, um, I don't know how to deal with the waste, but you shouldn't have any waste, so 
anything which deals with the waste management is wrong, right? We, we, have to, we have to start from the premise we are making waste and we cannot just dump it, right? And right now, I feel we are caught between the climate deniers who say, why do we need this stuff in the first place? And on the other, the purists who say, well, you allow people to use energy, right? And we have to somehow figure out how to square that circle and, and get through in the middle because the world will need energy. We cannot feed 10 billion people on the planet, and that's where we are going, without having access to energy. And if we want a living standard where we can go to a conference in Aspen, where we can travel, where we can get goods shipped to us, we will need a transportation system. We need infrastructure. We will need energy. And if we cannot figure that out, we are in trouble. And so for that reason, I love getting off fossil fuel. I do think the idea of having liquid fuels is actually important. And if we can manage to do that by closing the carbon cycle and be running a world economy which truly runs on solar, uh, that I think would be very exciting. But it, it'll take time. Yeah, so in a way what we need is a carbon price, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, we, that, we would, need, that would sort of get the whole thing running, yes? I, I, I actually think you, you, you can do slightly less. You, if you actually said what we said was sewage, you can't just dump it into the gutter, right? You figure out what you do with it, and I will argue that the marginal price of a ton of CO2, which will evolve from that, is the price of air capture and storage. Because if you can't think of anything cheaper than that, this you will do and can do. And I think the moment you force this issue, all sorts of better solutions will come up. I, for example, would, people said, well, why would you do that if you could get it at a, at a power plant? Of course you should get it at the power plant and not let it out. But this is a little bit of saying I don't need a street sweeper because we have a garbage bin at the corner of the street and people will voluntarily put it there. Yep. You still need the street sweeper. But that street sweeper will also set the price. So I think the, margin, the price of CO2 in the end in order to solve climate change is the cost of getting it back out. So, so just sort of thinking about this, um, <clears throat> farmers need incentives to you know, take CO2 back from the air, and Keith talked about that. Um, you know, Ellen talked about you know, the, the whole idea of um, you know, what we need to do to improve our system in order to, to do this. And uh, at the same time, um, it would be helpful if we had a price on carbon. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, you know, every once in a while, I, I sort of go, people in Congress are doing the right thing. It's not often, uh, <laughs> but uh, there was a uh, uh, budget bill that just came out, and uh, Section 45Q of that budget now will remunerate companies for this is storing big. carbon. Yes, this is actually very important. What you can get, if you can get together 100,000 tons of CO2 a year and safely store it and put it away, you can get a $50 tax credit, which is, exact, is worth $50, right? Uh, that's a, it's a great starting point, and I would argue that farming, to me, in the analogy of energy, is like hydroelectricity. There's nothing to argue about it. It's cheap, it's good, and it works, but it's not, not ever going to be big enough to solve the problem by itself, but clearly it comes first in many ways. So if you now have the ability to do that, uh, Assume you could convince an oil company to think about that. Uh, put a voluntary button on the pump. Say, we, the oil company, spend $100 to put the CO2 away per ton. Uh, $50 we get back as a carbon credit. $25 we pay because we are interested in making this work. And you, the consumer, expresses their preference by paying the last $25 on that ton of CO2. It turns out you have to pay 22 cents extra on the gallon of gasoline to make that happen. Uh, that, that's the same number, just not expressed in tons of CO2, but in gallons of gasoline. Uh, would that be possible? If 1% of the people would push that button, you would have a, carbon re a CO2 storage sequestration effort which dwarfs anything we have. It would demonstrate that you could do it. I don't kid myself that volunteers would ever be big enough to solve the problem by themselves, but they would change the debate. So 
little pieces of incentives sprinkled around the system have the opportunity to sort of make things work. And so I think it's up to us to basically take action both locally and, you know, with our legislators to sort of incentivize them to sort of do this. So with that, what I'd like to do is throw the uh, questions out to the audience uh, so that you can ask questions of this terrific team um, about uh, areas where you've, where you've got questions. Yeah. Amanda? Thank you for a wonderful panel. I actually have a question for Hank Rogers. Given what, uh, <laughs> given what was just said and the amazing, amazing leadership that you have shown in Hawaii, Hank, in getting us to the 100% target for renewable energy and now the 100% clean transportation and now a carbon zero, and Hank has done an incredible job with advocacy. So my question is, do you think it might be possible to bring about the legislative change that was just talked about so that we could actually do an experiment around this issue of carbon capture. Imagine if we could do this direct air capture and make it economically viable. That could be an incredible role model for the rest of the world. So, Hank, is it, is it something that we might try? <laughs> Put you at the Where's spot. <laughs> Yes, we'll do it. No, there's right Hank, in the right in the lights. Right in the lights. Um, it's all about the economic feasibility of that. You know, um, legislators will do things that uh, if you can show them that it's going to make them money somehow, <laughs> then it's easy. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, the, the changes that we have in Hawaii, when the electric company actually did the analysis, they, they came to the conclusion that if they went 100% renewable by 2040, they would save $7 billion for ratepayers. And uh, why didn't they think of this before? It's because they're just thinking about what's the steady state and how to keep things going the way they are. Um, so if we can show legislators that we have a way of not only cleaning up the environment, but saving them some money or the company savings, then we are in business. So we need that link to the future and we can break a few rules. <laughs> a question back here. So. Uh, uh, a couple of you mentioned the need for incentives, which I think is, is really true. And it's important to have a solid justification for that, which I think is basically that the polluters are avoiding a lot of costs that they really need to carry. Uh, and, and also, it's unfair to tax uh, polluters the same as non-polluters, uh, because they're, they're, those polluters are simply, if you do that, you're accelerating the polluters and adding to the uh, public budget that's going to be needed to clean that up eventually. But, um, you know, uh, we did a lot of work with the Nature Conservancy on, on uh, agricultural incentives for clean tax cuts and with you guys for the, for, uh, we did a lot of work with, with ASU and with Bill Brandt and Klaus on uh, uh, clean tax cuts for uh, carbon uh, air capture and carbon capture and, and clean tech innovation. And I'm pleased to say that that's in the new federal uh, uh, act that we're proposing, the Barry Free Clean Capital Market. On the, on the, on the, uh, the one thing that isn't in there is the agriculture, which I think is an incredibly important component. And I, I'd sug I suggest that you look at the, the Nature Conservancy uh, st uh, study that, they, that we did with them on applying clean tax cuts to agriculture. Because while there were a lot of really good ideas uh, for doing it there, we found that the big stumbling block was the lack of certification. You know, there isn't a single overarching certification standard for what constitutes regenerative farming. And you need that, you really need that, if you want to apply really good policy leverage to that area. You need to be able to identify very easily and clearly what's a regenerative product, what's a regenerative farm, and the certification piece of it, you know, is, is key. I'd love your thoughts on that. Now, just briefly, I, I, that's a great point. That was really what I was, uh, trying to show in that kind of complex system diagram at the end, which was really about, you know, I guess I would call it uh, metrics, you know, how to measure. How can, and if you're going to have a, if you're going to have something that's certified, that implies that you, you have a, uh, you've measured some, some, some characteristic or value and, and you can stand behind it. And so 
and we're, I'm working a lot with uh, TNC and, and others. They're involved, for example, in this kind of emerging effort to try to, to get at this, uh, you know, kind of a coordinated, improved quantification system that's out there. So I, I, would, I think you're 100% right. That's, that is a stumbling block for the policy implementation. And I think part of that, too, though, is, you know, is feeding back to the, to the, to the land managers of all type that they uh, understand that they can produce these products and they can, uh, you know, in some way be rewarded from it. It could be through, you know, lots of different ways, but. Great, well I have to say the uh, red light's gone off and they're gonna take the hook and take us off stage. So uh, I, for those of you who have other questions, please get to the panelists, they'll be around. And I just wanna thank the panelists for a terrific uh, presentation, thank you.